Hello and welcome to News Click. Today, we are going to talk about the developing situation with respect to the coronavirus pandemic or COVID-19 in India. And with us, we have Dr. Yogesh Jain, one of the founders of Jan Swasti Sahayog, an NGO that provides community health services in Chhattisgarh. Thank you so much, Dr. Yogesh, for joining us. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. So, uh, I'll start with the issue of testing. So, one of the key questions that uh, journalists, health experts have been asking from the very beginning this news emerged was whether India is doing enough tests. And when we look at the, the numbers are not completely available in the first place. And even when we look at the numbers, we find that there are huge variations. States like Kerala have done relatively larger number of tests, whereas there are a number of states which have done very, very few. And the question from the very beginning has been that whether the low number of tests probably is concealing the actual spread of the disease and the seriousness of the situation. So you've written a bit about this. So could you tell us what you think on the situation right now? So I, uh, it's clear that you know the the testing uh, criteria as a way to decide whom to diagnose and uh, to diagnose well enough has been uh, flawed and uh, seems to suggest that there has been there is a attempt not to know the exact truth about the burden of the problem that we have in the country. So, uh, while in the garb of, you know, certain assumptions that uh, the problem has not really been, uh, you know, percolated into the community, has not spread into the community, uh, we chose a very stringent criteria for the first uh, several weeks of this pandemic in India. Uh, uh, in fact, as late as still two days ago, this has been that, you know, we are not, uh, we have been only investigating and offering the tests uh, for the COVID-19 to only those who had come from abroad and were symptomatic with fever and cough. Or if there was right. a health worker or a family member who was in contact with a lab-proven COVID-positive person. Now, with this restricted criteria, obviously the number that we picked up as problems were very few. In spite of the fact that there were several of us who were found to have been infected within the country. And right. we uh, had been uh, asking uh, for evidence of, you know, the lack of community transmission, uh, as it is called, that is transmission happening within the country, where the uh, experts uh, who decide this testing criteria would say that in their limited search uh, for the, on the samples that they collected from some random patients, they did not find evidence of COVID-19 in their uh, body secretions. And thus they uh, said the lack of evidence was evidence that there was no community transmission and thus there was no need to test them. I think uh, in this limited criteria, in, in this uh, making such a stringent criteria, there were some things also operating such as uh, whether the uh, number of test kits that the country had at their disposal were fewer um, uh, than what they needed. And secondly, they, uh, they used the uh, bogey of not uh, creating a panic situation of uh, a lot right. of people going for, uh, for the test. But I think in the process, we missed out a few weeks, um, I would say at least two weeks in picking up the problem in adequate numbers. Because without picking up someone who's got COVID positive, COVID-19 positive, even if we don't have any treatment for it, we would have been able to isolate you know, um, and, uh, you know, uh, quarantine people who would be infected, preventing the disease from spreading to other people um, by appropriately isolating and, you know, offering treatment to those uh, who would be able to get out with minor, with, you know, uh, non, non uh, very high level uh, treatment also, like giving oxygen and other things that would have been possible. So uh, we are learning it the hard way now. And only as late as uh, two days ago, the ICMR, which is the um, uh, government body entrusted with deciding on the testing criteria, has has uh, added a few more criteria for investigating. So that now they also offer it for those with severe pneumonias who are coming to the public uh, hospitals. Plus, they have also now uh, allowing it for symptomatic healthcare workers, even if they have, don't have a contact with a COVID positive person, they're offering this test. And, but uh, the, still the numbers have to pick up as uh, late as yesterday, uh, there were only 18,000 tests done for the entire country, of which uh, close to 500 samples are positive. Right. 
So uh, the key question, like you mentioned here, is also the issue of test kits. So is uh, when we're talking about the lack of enough test kits, is it a supply issue or is it that, could you talk a bit about what exactly is the problem there? So I think the, um, they needed to, they, for this, for, for performing this uh, test, which is a nucleic acid uh, detection test, test uh, PCR, polymerase chain reaction based test, you need uh, machines that can do the PCR, which we have in plenty. So they, uh, the country has um, more than 100 institutions which can do this test on, a, on a, at least uh, about 100 tests a day without uh, without uh, without even you know uh, going uh, into full steam uh, but you also need probes and uh, reagents to do this uh, uh, this testing of this specific genome of this uh, virus and that has to be procured from uh, various places i know for one that the niv pune which is the nodal center in the country uh, to do the confirmation test have developed their own test kits and uh, even uh, as um, even till yesterday, there were 18 candidate tests uh, 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 clamoring for validation so that they could be offered uh, to a much larger network of diagnostic labs, of which two have been right. confirmed to be validated yesterday. Uh, and at the same time, not only uh, this is offers now, um, you know, uh, but even even before this, uh, two extra tests were validated. The country had enough numbers, I am told, at least 100,000 kits they had, uh, which could have been, you know, uh, they could have ramped up their diagnostic um, process. So compared to countries like uh, Germany and South Korea and Singapore and, uh, uh, and now increasingly, um, uh, not as a good example, but United States is also doing a, such a large number of tests now. And yet we are with the lo one of the lowest uh, rates per million for of tests being done so in any case the the the, the chance the run the thing that we're running is that we are missing out on some people who have, who have the disease and uh, are not picked up and thus the mm -hmm. we are allowed the epidemic to progress where we could have you know uh, picked it up uh, earlier and you know sort of uh, restricted the total number of secondary infections that would have happened so what you're also saying is that community transmission is prob is probably well underway in India already. Absolutely, I, I have no doubts that community transmission is there. Even if the latest um, uh, data from the last few days suggests that for uh, close to 50 to 20 percent of patients, uh, the uh, most most uh, data sets say that they don't even know where the person got infected from. And whenever uh, such a question is asked in press conferences. The people who decide say that they don't want to share, you know, personal data in this case, which is actually one is not asking for personal data. One is asking for the the mechanism where those uh, people could have got infected uh, in the first place, which is actually in 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 the larger interest of the of the entire um, uh, pandemic management that we need to understand. Um, uh, but that that even that information is denied to the uh, people who are asking for that um, that bit. Yes. And the other key question here is regarding the personal protection equipment for health workers who are in the front lines of, uh, say, dealing with this pandemic. Now, we had this huge celebration, so-called celebration on Sunday to honor their work. But many media reports as well as testimonies from health workers themselves have pointed out that there seems to be, in many hospitals at least, and many centers, a shortage of such equipment, especially if you're looking at the possibility of a major inflow of patients. Absolutely. Uh, so I think there is a personal protection equ protection in equipment, uh, which includes masks, gowns, gloves, and those uh, hazmat suits. Um, they are uh, and the sanitizers um, are have been in short supply because of uh, lack of um, information for the community and thus uh, overuse and a misuse and uh, hoarding done by the people um, at large. Right. Uh, in spite of the government having a lead time of close to three weeks uh, from uh, the end of February when they made a strategic plan uh, to procure uh, pr uh, per this personal protection equipment in large numbers to plan for the uh, control of the epidemic, they did not set in place their procurement uh, policies and uh, practices in, uh, in, in the right place and even uh, even a couple of days ago, we have known that 
uh, from good media reports and from direct interviews with the production, those the manufacturers associations uh, of these uh, personal protection equipment, that they would not be able to provide adequate numbers of these things even over the next few weeks. Uh, and we are already in a crisis. Uh, there is a shortage all over of all the equipment, uh, personal protection equipment, and which is going to worsen into a into a into a uh, really an emergency in the next few days. Uh, there is little doubt that that would happen. And in the middle of this, uh, they come up with an advisory that they issued yesterday of offering a drug like hydroxychloroquine for health workers who are going to be exposed to those who are suspected or confirmed the COVID positive. In a sense, um, making, uh, you know, uh, sort of trying to assuage the uh, health workers uh, who were not let taken in by those uh, thalis and the thalis, uh, that they would, they, even if they don't have those masks and gowns, they would be having a drug to protect them. So uh, we know clearly uh, even uh, that this drug is not going to replace the personal protection equipment uh, value. And if at all, the, uh, and even, the, even if they look at the data, there is no data for a preventive value of this hydroxychloroquine being available through any studies. It is only a stretch of imagination from some one study of its use in treatment of some people in France that they are extrapolating it to use to um, in a to for, for prevention of COVID infection, and in the process um, being unscientific as well as practicing poor public health uh, management of a, a pandemic like this, where you are ex where you are killing a drug which might be potentially useful for further use uh, in treatment of people who become very sick, but also at the same time uh, allowing the public with you know poor information and uh, leading to a shortage and uh, stockpiling of this drug, which uh, would thus make it only available for a few people in the country rather than everyone who would need it. So uh, one of the key areas of your work has also been on community health. And that also involves looking at the socio-economic aspect of health itself. So as far as the government is concerned right now, what would you suggest are the key priority items on this front? When we're talking about livelihoods, we're talking about the economic impact, the number of daily wage laborers in India, for instance. So keeping all these things in mind, in addition to, say, ramping up testing, in addition to providing or trying to procure as much as, pers as, much as personal protection equipment as possible, on this front, what does the government need to do? So uh, I would clearly say that we need, uh, you know, two major uh, interventions that, that uh, should be there. First, we need to protect people's health, not just from COVID infections, but also from all the other things for which people access the public health systems. So I don't want someone to die of tuberculosis uh, uh, because the person did not get his TB drugs uh, in time and yet saved from COVID infection. So I would want all the, all the uh, public health programs that look at people's management of illnesses uh, where, are, where time sensitively you require drugs to be continued whether it is tuberculosis, diabetes, HIV, leprosy, cancer, and so many other illnesses, uh, I don't want the public health system to close its outpatients and uh, chronic disease management uh, uh, strategies uh, at the community and clinic levels to, uh, you know, to be uh, crunched by our e efforts to control this pandemic that we are still not doing very well at. The second, which is far more important, is um, the way we are using some strategies like uh, lockdown. In this case, you know, locking up an entire community is called a lockdown. I don't know why it is not called a lockup of the community. Uh, doing it in an inhuman way, killing the, uh, the, the social and the economic lives of people uh, where um, when we know that the majority of us are still in an informal economy situation, to not protect people uh, through uh, uh, adequate provision of food and their other needs uh, uh, is something that is, you know, completely um, unacceptable to make uh, people die of, you know, uh, of illnesses due to, um, uh, due to, which are happened due to hunger uh, or due to, uh, you know, uh, lack of money for other things. 
but save them from covid infection so i in in the even in the way this lockdown has been organized suddenly stopping all means of transport has led to a large uh, you know uh, movement of people from uh, cities where they had migrated to their uh, rural areas in um, where they come from whether it's jharkhand chatisgarh rajasthan um, uh, coming back from gujarat maharashtra and other bigger towns in a sense also not getting uh, leaving in haste and uh, you know but also probably uh, possibly getting you know the virus along with them and spreading it uh, to the community uh, where they are finally right. reaching and in the process also you know completely without any protection for uh, their livelihoods and uh, their and their lives in a sense so uh, learning from uh, the way uh, kerala has done and maybe some other countries have been doing which have higher social security systems better security systems we need to go on a on a war footing to prevent our people from from you know uh, from uh, from dying due to other reasons and uh, their lives being destroyed for all times to come uh, when uh, while we are trying to prevent this pandemic from uh, you know affect uh, killing people due to uh, in the short and the long run and uh, you know you we need to see this um, uh, pandemic uh, uh, from a, we need to have a humanistic you know humanistic lockdown rather than a like an inhuman lockdown that we have been having right um, uh, and you know even prisoners in a lockup have certain rights which uh, we need to protect as at the moment if we are all prisoners of this of the state at the moment uh people need to be protected by providing adequate food healthcare and you know what other all the other rights that are still uh, valid when you know even you're locked up right and finally there's also the question of uh, scientific temper because we saw how on sunday people gathered across the country in many places it became all, it almost descended into a procession or a celebration and before that there were all these whatsapp messages there's been a lot of fake news going around regarding how coronavirus can basically disappear in 12 hours or that clapping or sounds made basically kill the virus and a lot of this is done by supposedly educated middle class people as well so there's also the larger question of a social crisis we are facing in terms of scientific temper when when as far as dealing with coronavirus is concerned yeah so we are uh, reaping the harvest of a uh, lack of scientific temper or uh, i would say distemper in a sense of uh, in the country uh, and added to this you know the the lack of transparency and secrecy about information you know uh, adds uh, misery to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, misinformation that goes around um if you don't tell people what are the symptoms and you don't test people when they want to test it get this get themselves tested and don't provide the right information at the right time then people will obviously imagine things about causes and uh, you know treatments of uh, problems that they face and attribute it to you know uh, through racial slurs or through you know destroying the poultry industry that has happened now where swine flu was probably confused with coronavirus infection uh and uh, thus people culled you know uh, thousands and uh, lakhs of uh, poultry uh, in most of central india destroying the livelihoods of a uh, large number of people plus also you know endangering people's nutrition levels uh this has been um, this is this is this makes uh, interesting yet macabre uh, you know observation the way um, uh crises like these bring out uh, the worst the the worst fault lines in our you know understanding of the world around and um, uh, the lack of science and the scientific temper that we have in uh, in our minds uh, as we approach and also the lack of social um, uh, the social and the uh, economic fault lines also come out very clearly most of this most of the recommendations regarding social distancing sort of uh, are targeted only at the middle class and the uh, city folks rather than about um, uh, all the city folk and about uh, the rural folk uh, where most of these uh, advisories make no sense thank you so much dr yogesh for talking to us that's all we have time for today keep watching news click